IAS Academy. Admissions open for UPSC Coaching 2021-22. Class it starts on June 28th. For admissions contact 766-7766-266. to the Hindu news analysis by Shankar AS Academy. These are a list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles will be provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. This editorial article is with reference to India-Africa relations. We will be discussing this from Maine's point of view. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, India and African ties, they are historic. And in the recent past, India is engaging with Africa with renewed commitment and vigor. And for this, we can say the summits called as India-Africa summits are a testimony for that. India is also engaging with Africa in the realm of technology and also in the humanitarian aspect as well. In this article, the author discusses the importance of Africa in the diplomatic game and the author also talks about the latest trends in Indo-African engagement. So let us begin our discussion by knowing how India has engaged with Africa at various levels. Now, if you take trade, according to Confederation of Indian Industry, in the year 2020-2021, India's exports to Africa stood at 27.7 billion US dollars and India's imports from Africa stood at 28.2 billion US dollars. So overall, we can say that the bilateral trade value stood at 55.9 billion US dollars or approximately 56 billion US dollars. If you take investment wise, the total investments over 25 years, that is the last 25 years from April 1996 to March 2021, which flow from India are 70.7 billion US dollars. Now coming to the field of science, through the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation programs, shortly called as ITEC programs, India has been assisting Africa. By default, 40% of ITEC slots are reserved for African nationals. And in order to augment the capacity of Africa, India has contributed 1 million US dollars towards African Capacity Building Foundation. What is this foundation? See, it is the African Union's specialized agency for capacity development called as African Capacity Building Foundation. Then if you consider the Pan-African E-Network, India has invested 100 million US dollars. So here India's investment is an effort to bridge the digital divide in Africa. See, this project was conceived by former Indian President Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam and it was launched in the year 2009. And under this Pan-African e-network project, India has set up a fiber optic network so as to provide satellite connectivity, telemedicine, then teleeducation to countries of Africa. So India has taken medicine and education closer to the African people. And also know that India and Japan have agreed to collaborate on a corridor called as Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. In connection to this, a vision document to that effect has also been released. In addition to these engagements, India also trains African soldiers in Indian military academies. And uh, approximately 6,000 Indian soldiers are deployed in five conflict zones in Africa under the UN peacekeeping missions. All this helps in augmenting the security capacity of the African countries. And last year, in 2020, the first ever India-Africa Defense Minister's Conclave took place. It happened in Feb 2020. It was conducted on the margins of Defense Expo 2020. Yes, all this looks bright and promising, but we also do have areas of challenges. Now let us look at some of these challenges. We saw that bilateral trade was valued at close to 56 billion US dollars in 2020-2021. However, if you compare this number with 2019-20, there is a reduction by 10.8 billion US dollars. And if you compare with another year called as 2014-15, we can see a reduction of 15.5 billion US dollars. 
So this is one area which needs attention. And also experts say that the composition of India-Africa trade, that is what are the areas in which India-Africa trade, the items, etc., has not also changed much over the last two decades. Then secondly, our investments in Africa are just 70.7 billion. We saw that for the last 25 years. But it is said that this is only about one third of China's investment in Africa. So we have to work on this area as well. Thirdly, the credit lines that we have extended to Africa suffer from slow processing. So this gives China the way and gap to fill the needs of Africa with its quick cash. Next, let us look into the China factor. See, China has successfully used this pandemic to expand its footprint in Africa. It has increased the outflow of its vaccines. But sadly, India's vaccine diplomacy or vax diplomacy has suffered a setback as uh, we witnessed a debilitating second wave of COVID-19 and we also experienced shortage of vaccine raw materials and other challenges. And if you come to China's participation in infrastructure projects, it is remarkable. See, China has recently built two important rail lines called as Addis Ababa Djibouti and Mombasa Nairobi rail lines. And China is now eyeing to develop the vast East Africa master railway plan as well. But on the other side, if you take India's Asia-Africa growth corridor, it is only at the vision document stage. Therefore, India is lagging far behind with reference to China in these areas. Then in the recent years, several extra-regional economies have strengthened their engagement with African states. All this is with an eye to you know, gain track of rising economic opportunities in Africa, which includes energy, mining, infrastructure, connectivity. And this the author calls as third scramble. So India, with its limited resources, is finding very difficult to compete here. All these challenges have to be addressed and we should overcome these aspects of challenges as well. And recently at the United Nations Security Council, India has voiced for Africa. India said that the voice of Africa is not given proper due at the Security Council. So raising Africa's cause at such a global forum is a kind of promising start to overcome the challenges we have with the African region. Then traditionally, if you see, China had enjoyed the economic might, but India has significant social capital among the African population. India is trusted, unlike China, because China is looked at dubiously or with suspicion, and India should leverage this factor to its favor. Then coming to India-Africa Forum Summits. The third summit was held in 2015. The fourth summit has been pending since last year. It is believed that it will be held as soon as possible, at least in a virtual format. Such engagements should not be missed. Then coming to financial assistance to Africa, this should be renewed and new financial routes or new routes to support shall be created. A common fund for African nations can be created by India to help in capacity building as well. Finally, the author says that to overcome the China challenge in Africa, Increased cooperation between India and its international allies should be prioritized or is necessary. For instance, Japan has interest in Africa. India should work with such like-minded countries to further its own interests and agenda. The author states that it is time to seize the opportunity and to restore Africa to its primary position in India's diplomacy and economic engagement. I mean, essence, if you take India and Africa, they share a rich history of cultural, economic and political interactions. All this is rooted in the spirit of developing together as equals. And it is said that India-Africa ties may redefine the contours of international order along more egalitarian lines. And India should work on those lines and India should improve its engagement and it should address all the challenges that we have just now saw in this analysis. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this editorial article. In this analysis, we saw the level of engagement between India and Africa. We saw the challenges in the relations. We saw how China factor plays an important role in India's calibration of ties with Africa, etc. Now let's move on to next news article analysis. This article in page 2 of Delhi edition pays tribute to the legendary Sikh general Baba Banda Singh Bahadur on his 305th martyrdom anniversary. The article reports that 
he was the founder of first sikh raj which stands out as an unparalleled and iconic moment in india's history and he is also reported to be sri guru gobind singh's great disciple so in this context let us discuss about banda singh bahadur from exam perspective see baba banda singh bahadur's time period is from 1670 ad to 1716 ad he was born in a rajput family his childhood name was lakman das he became a disciple of guru gobind singh and guru gobind singh taught him the basic principles of sikhism and also baptized him which is a ritual and he was also christened by guru gobind singh with the name banda singh or in other words guru gobind singh gave him another name called as banda singh and as we know guru gobind singh was the 10th sikh guru now banda singh later he became a sikh warrior and proved to be a great sikh general and he established sikh rule in large part of punjab so he became a famous saint soldier of guru gobind singh see banda singh captured large part of punjab and established sikh rule there so he established first sikh raj in punjab in other words he established the kalsa republic as instructed by guru gobind singh now why is he known for see he is known for his struggle against mughal empire in early 18th century he confronted mughals in the northern india from 1710 to 1716 he fought three battles against mughals though some of the confrontations were brief they were strong enough to shake the foundations of mughals and this led to the rise of sikh power he is especially known for the attack on mughal provincial capital sirhind this attack happened in the year 1710 see sirhind was the headquarters of mughal administration in eastern punjab Banda Bahadur destroyed the city and killed its governor Wazir Khan. This is a kind of revenge because Wazir Khan earlier killed two younger sons of Guru Gobind Singh. So Banda Bahadur killed this Wazir Khan also. Banda Bahadur also fought for the freedom and protection of poor and marginalized people and also for upliftment of all sections of society. One of the most revolutionary acts of Banda Bahadur was that he abolished the zamindari system in Punjab. and he granted proprietary rights to the actual tillers of the land because of that banda bahadur became the first ruler of the world to abolish feudal system even much earlier than the french revolution now another important fact to be noted is the importance of logar or lokar fort it is in the present day yamuna nagar district of haryana it is one of the most important places in sikh history see lokar means fort of steel This place became the capital of first Sikh state. Actually in 1709 to 1710 it was declared by Baba Banda Singh Bahadur as the Sikh state capital or Kalsa Rajdhani. Note that at that point of time this place Lohgarh was the largest fort in the world. According to recent archaeological research the epicenter of this fort is spread in almost 7000 acres. and it took almost 70 to 80 years for making of construction of such a huge fortification it is said that its construction was started by sixth sikh guru who is the sixth sikh guru he is guru hargobind sahib in fact the three major battles which we discussed above they were fought here only between the sikhs and the mughals and throughout these battles fort lokar remained unconquerable or indestructible or invincible but after the arrest of baba banda singh bahadur this fort was captured by the mughals and they finally demolished the fort therefore this place is not only important from sikh history perspective but also of national importance now another notable contribution is that he minted coins in the names of guru nanak dev ji and guru gobind singh ji and issued some orders as well on the back side of the coin he inscribed lohgar as kalsa takht now takht means seat of authority See in the meantime during these battles Farooq Siyar became Delhi's emperor and this person ordered the capture of Banda Singh and as we know Farooq Siyar became emperor in 1713 and he ordered capture of Banda Singh as a result of continuous expeditions Mughals finally captured Banda Singh in December 1715 Banda Singh along with 700 soldiers they were taken to Delhi and they were actually tortured to convert to Islam but none of them converted or none of them deterred from their faith 
they were humiliated in delhi later banda singh was cruelly executed in 1716 it is said that he was cruelly executed by pincing the flesh from his body gouging his eyes out and later cut into pieces very cruel manner he was killed so baba banda singh bahadur is known for his undaunted valor bravery patriotism fearlessness dedication and sacrifice this led him to be hailed as one of the greatest ever sikhs he is also remembered as the one who paved the way for successive khalsa raj in addition just note that he is also known and much celebrated in bengal particularly after nobel laureate rabindranath tagore wrote a poem titled as bandi bir which is a poem about baba banda singh bahadur these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article wherein we discussed about baba banda singh bahadur and his importance in indian history now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article reports about a confrontation between russia and and uk see recently russia accused uk of spreading lies over a warship confrontation in the black sea and it warned london of resolute response in case of any further provocative actions by the british navy see russia uses black sea to project its power in the mediterranean region and black sea has remained as a flash point between russia and its competitors for centuries here competitors include turkey france us uk you know that russia seized and annexed crimean peninsula from ukraine in 2014 and since then russia considers areas around crimea as its waters or to be russian waters however western countries deem crimea to be part of ukraine and reject russia's claim to the seas around it so in this regard let us see some important facts related to black sea see black sea is a large inland sea that is situated at southeastern extremity of europe we can see countries bordering black sea such as ukraine russia georgia turkey bulgaria and romania now the notable feature of black sea is that it is the world's largest meromictic basin that means deep waters in such basin do not mix with upper layers of water see the upper layers of water are those which receive oxygen from the atmosphere opposite to meromictic is what we call as holomictic holomictic is a water body having layers of water that intermix at least once a year and since black sea is a meromictic basin the oxygen is dissolved and rich sea life is supported only in the upper water levels as a result over 90% of deeper black sea volume is anoxic or depleted of dissolved oxygen or in other words the lower levels of sea are almost biologically dead because of continued weak ventilation of the deep layers and coming to transportation aspect it is an important year round transportation artery and it links eastern european countries with world's markets and the most widely used biological resource of black sea is fish and conservation and anti pollution measures in black sea include banning of dolphin fishing restrictions on oil tankers and disposal of industrial waste in 1992 heads of state and government of 11 countries signed a summit declaration and bosporus statement in istanbul and this led to the formation of black sea economic cooperation so the 11 countries include albania armenia azerbaijan bulgaria georgia greece moldova romania russia turkey and ukraine and know that this multilateral political and economic initiative it aims at fostering interaction and harmony among the member states and it ensures peace stability and prosperity in the black sea region so it's a regional body so these are some of the important points with reference to the analysis of this news article now let's move on to next part of the discussion this editorial is titled as the rural economy can jump start a revival in this article the author talks about the need for the government to adopt effective and immediate policy measures so as to revive the rural economy the article states that rural economy has got the potential to recover quickly provided proper planning is done so in this slide let us see some important points that are mentioned in this editorial article the syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference as we know recently the national statistical office released gdp growth estimates for the fiscal year 2020-21 and according to it the growth in gdp during 2020-21 is estimated to be at minus 7.3% or contracted by 7.3% 
and this has worsened the economic recovery and also has led to loss of livelihood for majority of households the authors points to two reasons for this decline one is the trend of slowdown in economic activity since 2016-17 and the other reason is the result of mishandling of the economic situation well this is the larger scenario let us see the role of rural economy in the growth of our country when we take agricultural sector it has played a major role in india's economic performance despite inadequate fiscal support it has also been a consistently important driver for the economy throughout the last few years when we faced economic slowdown and in fact it is said that agriculture was the only major sector to report an increase in gross value added in the year 2020-21 in addition to providing jobs to the returning migrants during the covid lockdown the sector has also played a very important role in sustaining the rural economy during the pandemic however if there will be a third wave or subsequent waves the article states that we are unable to say that rural sector will play savior again like it did in last year and similarly we cannot predict or make any inference on how the economy recovery will also be this is because a majority of households who suffered job losses and who faced loss of income or decline in income are yet to regain their pre pandemic levels so therefore the author states that even if we witness a positive growth in this fiscal year it will not be a real recovery see the actual extent of devastation in the rural areas has not been captured and a major part of economic distress remains unreported underreported and also underestimated and according to the author even the response from government was not in proportion with the scale of the pandemic in rural areas for example the government has not increased the allocation this year for the national rural employment guarantee scheme or the narega program though there is significant increase in employment demand from the rural areas then the extended free food grain scheme also does not include pulses this year like it did last year moreover the factors like declining wholesale prices of most of the agricultural commodities or the rise in inflation in pulses and oil seeds groups they have also further contributed to the decline in rural demand see the rising inflation has the potential to reduce the purchasing power of the rural economy see the rural economy as we saw is already struggling with declining incomes and job losses then the declining wholesale prices leads to less realization of remunerative prices for the rural produce then apart from this the shift in terms of trade against agriculture then the rise in input prices for diesel then increase in cost of fertilizers rising inflation in international commodity prices and also the increase in cost of raw materials all these things further threatens a decline in the rural economic sector however in spite of the setbacks the rural economy continues to remain crucial for any strategy of economic revival the author concludes by asserting on the need for proactive intervention from the government to protect the rural population how this can be done this can be done by speeding up vaccination then by protecting the domestic rural producers or the rural population from rising inflation in input prices etc apart from this government can also lend fiscal support you know both in terms of direct income support as well as through various subsidies as well these measures are expected to support economic revival and also they have the potential to prevent another humanitarian crisis that may arise because of economic mismanagement or because of economic challenges so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this editorial article in this discussion we saw about rural economy role of agriculture in the economy the hurdles met by the rural sector and also the possible way forward now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article is about the report of comptroller and auditor general on tamil nadu finances for the year 2018 19 in the report the cag has reported several anomalies like understating revenue and fiscal deficits then expenditure without proper appropriation by legislature and various other aspects in this context let us discuss in detail about the comptroller and auditor general of india the syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference see in a democracy those holding power and positions of responsibility must to be answerable for their actions 
For this purpose, the constitution has mandated several institutions like judiciary and one among them is CAG. Know that CAG and the Indian Audit and Accounts Department that is functioning under CAG, they constitute the Supreme Audit Institution of India. And if you come to constitution, articles 148 to 151 deals with Comptroller and Auditor General. Article 148 states that there shall be a CAG for India who shall be appointed by the President by warrant under hand and seal. See, the constitution enables the independent and unbiased nature of audit by the CAG. First, CAG is appointed by President of India but has a security of tenure because there is a special procedure for removal which is like a Supreme Court judge. Then the salary and expenses of CAG are charged and not voted to the Consolidated Fund of India. So it cannot be arbitrarily altered to CAG's disadvantage. Most importantly, CAG is not allowed from holding any other government office after the expiry of Herar his term. Now let's see the duties of CAG. See under Article 149, the Parliament had enacted a legislation called as the CAG's Duties, Powers and Conditions Act in the year 1971. It puts almost every spending, revenue collection or aid or grant receiving unit of the government under the audit domain of CAG. And as per Article 150, the accounts of the Union and the accounts of the states shall be kept in such form as the President may prescribe, but this shall be based on the advice of CAG. When CAG has to audit and report upon all receipts into and spending from the Consolidated Fund of Union and from the Consolidated Fund of the States. It also audits all transactions relating to the contingency funds, in other words the funds for the emergency purposes, and the public accounts at central as well as state levels. The CAG also audits accounts of all government companies and corporations like ONGC, SAIL, etc. It is also empowered to audit accounts of all autonomous bodies and authorities who receive government money. This can be municipal bodies, IIMs, IITs, even state health societies and others. And know that the reports of CAG are submitted to the President in case of Union or to the Governor in case of the State. They will in turn table the report before the Parliament or the appropriate state legislature. Then the reports are permanently referred to the Central and the State Standing Committees on Public Accounts or Committees on Public Undertakings. Now let's see the types of reports brought out by Comptroller and Auditor General of India. See the audit reports of CAG consist of Compliance and Performance Audit Report. This covers revenue collection and expenditure of government. Then separate audit reports on the functioning of certain autonomous bodies. There will also be reports on the financial position of central and state governments. Then reports on adherence to the appropriation acts passed by parliament and state legislatures. CAG also submits certified annual accounts of the states to the state legislatures. These are known as finance and appropriation accounts. Now let's see the types of audits done by CAG. They are classified into three. They are uh, compliance audit, financial attest audit and then performance audit. You will see we will discuss in detail about these audits in the coming days in a related news article. Now coming to various organizations which are subject to the audit of the CAG, we have given us a form of image for your reference. Have a look at this. With this we come to the end of analysis of this news article. In this analysis we discussed about Comptroller and Auditor General of India, the duties of CAG, the reports brought out by CAG and the types of audits done by CAG and the organization subject to the audit of CAG. Now let's move on to next news article analysis. Now let's take this news article which talks about death of an elephant that was reported in Bannergatta National Park in Karnataka. Though authorities said that the death was accidental, environmentalists claim that the death was due to a traumatic shock. See there are many important national parks in Karnataka. They include Anshi National Park, Bandipur National Park, Bannergatta National Park, Nagarhole National Park, then Kudraimukh National Park. So let us discuss in detail today about Bannergatta National Park. Before going into that, let us see what exactly a national park is. See, as per section 35 of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, this section which deals with declaration of national parks, states that the state government can declare an area as a national park. This area can be either within a sanctuary or even outside the sanctuary. Now, a particular area shall be declared as national park because of its ecological significance, faunal or floral significance, or geomorphological or zoological 
association or importance and such declaration shall be for the purpose of protecting propagating and developing wildlife or its environment now know that the status of protection of a national park is higher than that of a wildlife sanctuary also all rights in respect of lands that are included in the national park are vested in the state government now with this let us discuss about banner gatta national park see this national park is situated very close to bengaluru which is the capital of karnataka and which is also the india's third most populous city and know that the land in the national park is undulating that is not even with broken chains of rocky hillocks and water courses see it was declared as a national park in 1974 initially with just an area of 100 square kilometer but currently the total area of the national park is just about 260 km square this comprises 13 reserve forests that are spread over three districts bengaluru urban bengaluru rural and ramanagara there are four ranges in the national park they are anekal bannergatta harohalli and kodihalli wildlife ranges and know that bannergatta biological park earlier was an integral part of this national park until it became an independent establishment in the year 2002 coming to its location to the south if you take the national park is contiguous to the krishnagiri and hosur forest divisions and to the north kaveri wildlife sanctuary of tamil nadu it is to the southwest it is contiguous to the kaveri wildlife sanctuary of karnataka and importantly know that the streams of swarnamugi rayathmala hole hebbahalla they drain the park into the river arkavadi in the kaveri basin and as we know arkavadi is a tributary of kaveri river and forests of the national park are mostly of scrub type with mixed dry deciduous patches in the valleys there are also some very good patches of madri bamboo as well and these are some of the animals found in the national park we can also occasional sighting of tiger is also reported so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article wherein we discussed about banner gatta national park now let's move on to next part of the discussion this news article talks about the need to save the oldest sanskrit theater this article was taken from friday review it talks about koodi atam which is a theatrical art form so today we will discuss about this art form from exam point of view see koodi atam is one of the most ancient living theatrical traditions the antiquity of this art form goes to 10th century ad it is said that king kulashekara varma structured this art and in fact he employed the art form in his own sanskrit plays for the repertory or the performance his sanskrit plays what we here refer are tapadi samvaranam and subhadra dhananjayam and if you see koodi atam finds its expression in kutambalam which means theater or auditorium these kutambalams are an inseparable part of temples in kerala and koodi atam was generally practiced and propagated by chakkiyar community and therefore it is also known by the name chakkiyar kootu as well to be very specific till the first half of 20th century this art form was usually performed by members of chakkiyar and nambiyar castes and performed only in temple theaters which were called as kutambalam and know that both men and women participate in this tradition mostly it uses sanskrit plays for its production the art form generally seeks inspiration from classics of kalidasa basa sri harsha pallava mahendra varma kulasegra sakti badra and others on performing the stage adoption is elaborate by and large this art form adheres to the acting technique which is elaborately described in natya shastra of bharata which is a basic book of indian dance but they also follow the stage manuals such as atta prakaram karma deepika hasta lakshana deepika and others coming to the costume the costume is semi realistic and the stage mannerisms are highly stylized cymbals idakai and a unique percussion instrument called milavu and flute they were used in the orchestra generally nangyars who are women in the nambiyar family they sing while the nambiyars who are the male members of this community they play the instruments the characters of this theater form are diverse we could see chakkiyar is the actor nambiyar is the instrumentalist nangyar are those taking on women's roles then sutradhar is the narrator and vidushak or jesters they are the protagonists it is the vidushak who alone delivers the dialogues 
but even single acts of plays are treated as full fledged plays and they are subjected to an elaborate method of acting and there is wide emphasis on hand gestures and eye movements these two aspects make this dance and theater form unique and though it is a sanskritic art form during performance language changes from sanskrit to prakrit and sometime even to classical malayalam and the chanting and uh, singing of koodi atam it resembles the vedic chanting tradition of kerala and the songs are set to several ancient ragas and know that krishna natam and kathakali they drew heavily from koodi atam that is they take lot of things from this ancient art form called as koodi atam which is koodi atam acting together and note that koodi atam has been notified as intangible cultural heritage of unesco along with mudiyattu so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article where we discussed about koodi atam now let's move on to next part of the discussion we have come to the last session the practice questions discussion session see this first question with reference to baba banda singh bahadur consider the following statements with reference to baba banda singh bahadur three statements are given they are asking which of the above statements is or are correct first statement he is known for his struggle in punjab against the british in the early 19th century see the statement is incorrect he is known for his struggle against the mughal empire in the early 18th century he confronted mughals in the northern india and fought three battles against mughals from 1710 to 1716 so first statement is incorrect through elimination we can arrive at the correct answer option c 2 and 3 only yes he declared lokar fort as khalsa rajdhani he abolished the zamindari system in punjab moving on to the next question with reference to comptroller and auditor general of india they have given four statements asking which of the above can be audited by comptroller and auditor general of india accounts of iim accounts of ongc spending from consulted fund of state governments public money held by governments such as postal savings see the correct answer for this question is option d all the above can be audited by cag this question is with reference to koodi atam consider the following statements it is also called as chakkiyar kootu which is correct it is notified as unesco intangible cultural heritage which is correct koodi atam is inspired from kathakali this statement is incorrect it is other way around kathakali is inspired from koodi atam third statement is incorrect so the correct answer is option b 1 and 2 only see this is a description based question This national park is located very near to Bengaluru city. Its forests are mostly of scrub type with mixed dry deciduous patches. Animals found in the park include panther, elephant, sloth bear, spotted bear etc. We are referring to the correct answer for this question is option D. All the other three are far away from Bangalore. So we can deduct the answer or arrive at the answer through the first line itself. Correct answer is option D. Bannargatta National Park. we have given two practice mains questions you may write the answer and post them in the comment section for peer review with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video click the like button comment share and subscribe to shankar ais academy youtube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation shankar ais academy admissions open for upsc coaching 2021 22 class it starts on june 28 for admissions contact 766776266